Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Sifu Allen Baker is a high performance coach and an internationally recognized martial arts and self-defense expert. He's been training continuously in the martial arts since 1981 and teaching since 1990. Allen has 40 years of continuous experience in the arts. He's the author of The Warrior's Path, a warrior-based approach to personal change and is the Civilian Tactical Training Association founder. Alan has appeared in several national magazine articles. In the course of his career, he has achieved a level of black belt or higher in multiple disciplines of martial arts, as well as numerous instructor level certifications and additional systems under some of the industry's most renowned teachers. It's a great pleasure that I welcome Sifu Alan Baker to the show. Welcome to the show. It's an honor, thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you, how did you begin your journey in the martial arts field? I know you've done this for a good part of your life, but what motivated you or prompted you to pursue this path? Uh, well, uh, I was a rowdy kid and I was probably a handful for my mom. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, at that time, they referred to my superpower as ADHD. And the answer for it was to drug it and slow it down. So fortunately for me, mom was like, nope, I'm not going to do that. You guys just have to handle it. And part of her attempt to handle it was she found a local martial artist uh, and said, can you help me with this excessive energy that my kid has? And uh, so, you know, I go in and I still remember to this day, the instructor had two sons. And uh, they, they obviously a lot more training than me. And first night I was like, I want to fight, you know, and he puts me in there and they just kick my butt and uh, one after another. But it's I, I got to go to this place and do things that I normally got in trouble for. I loved it. I fell in love with it right away. <laughs> I could go and be rowdy and, uh, you know, rough house. And it was OK, you know, and in the process of loving it. Um, Mr. Helms, uh, who was the instructor at the time, started to introduce thoughts and ways for me to control uh, the energy that I had, you know, um, and how I can channel it and use it. That, that was the spark uh, that, that, that lit the journey right there. Um, and uh, I was sold. I knew at that point, which is unusual, I hear now, uh, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And, you know, you went home and told mom, but at that time, she's like, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think she probably thought, sure. Yeah, yeah. For the first 20 years. <laughs> and then uh, took her a while to go, OK, I guess this is what you're going to do with yourself. <laughs> and uh, haven't looked back. I've been doing it ever since. Um involved in in it in multiple ways in the industry love it i love the people um you know the whole mentality um like you mentioned the book of uh, the approach of the warrior self-betterment improvement love it and so the rest is history as they say well and the reason i was really interested to have you on the show because your book intrigues me and i love the idea of mind body spirit in different disciplines, right? So I meditate a lot in my field of what I do. I meditate, but I know you do too. I know that you have your own viewpoints uh, that you've learned from the martial arts practices that are very spiritual in nature. 
And that for me is fascinating because my show focuses on looking at different levels of spirituality in our everyday lives to highlight what our audience might pick up from what you've learned. Like, mm-hmm. I guess one of my questions I want to ask you is what have you found to be the best mindfulness technique that you've employed for yourself before you like participate in a fight or if you compete or when you do your training sessions, is there something that you do that you've learned through your own practices that you'd wish to share with our audience about how to still the mind and concentrate and focus? Well, um, as far as bringing uh, the mind, the chin into the now and living in this moment, um, I found there's many different ways and, uh, you know, I, I like to help other people. So sometimes the ways work good for them, but for me, one of the biggest um, triggers I use is gratitude um, because it it brings me into the here and now. What am I grateful for? And it, it brings your attention into um, the now focus. I'm, you know, I'm grateful for where I am, the people that are around me, um, uh, the, the breakfast I had this morning. So you, you get more conscious in that moment. Um, so that is a big trigger for me. And I like it as well because, um, you know, meditation and different Qigongs, they'll achieve different things for you. And one of them for me is passion and the energy of passion. And gratitude does both things for that. You know, it brings me into the moment. And I, so I am living in this moment now. And at the same time, that gratitude gives you energy and passion for what you're getting ready to do. Um, For me, I I think meditation and mind work or body work or healer work, it depends on which angle you're coming, um, creates state. Um, So when I'm in a meditation, I'm entering into a state. And for me, you can create states for different things. Like I'm, I'm going to get ready for this fight or I'm my morning routine and I want to have positive energy. I want to have the correct mindset and, and I want to get the best start that I can get on this day. So that, that would be a little different. And so to me, all of that is a trigger to go into some of those chosen states that we would create for ourselves um, I could talk about it for the next hour. So I think that's fascinating because the stuff you're talking about, like on my side of it, you know, I meditate regularly and I do it. And it's just a normal thing for me when I'm online at the store, I can meditate when I'm driving in, in traffic, I can meditate. And people think meditation requires this, you know, totally closing yourself off, locking yourself away, maybe wrapping yourself some bubble wrap and like sitting like this and trying to come to a, a certain state of, mind, state of mind. I'm like, it doesn't work like that. It's a lot more simplistic. If you daydream, there's probably a form of meditation involved in that. And I wanted to see like, do you have your viewpoints about meditation that you've gained just from, I understand what you're, what you're talking about. Cause I appreciate it. But in terms of meditation itself, have you, have you learned anything new in your own way? Like during the last couple of years that you, you think, have been influential in your own spiritual practices? Um, well, one thing I will say, and you said it just now in your retort is, uh, the simplicity of it. Um, I, you, you know, when I had the, the tremendous opportunity to work with great teachers and one common thread in all of them. And sometimes we, I blind myself and I want to know everything. You know, <laughs> all the details. I want to hold all the techniques and, uh, and, and, but I find out as I go through the journey and I laboratory and I test it and I get up every morning and do it. Simplicity is mastery. So uh, the ability to simplify and just like you said, what is the simple way of doing it? And that's something I've found probably in the last five or 10 years is the more I've allowed myself to simplify the greater level of skill I've gained um, in in lots of different things, but meditation being one of them. It allows you to look for depth too, you know? So it's like I I could gather more information. I could go to my teacher and go, hey, teach me more things. And then I could go to teacher two, teach me more things. And now I have a bunch of things. Um, Or I could seek depth in 
one or two things that I have chosen intelligently outside of what I would say, what I would call a systemized influence. Um, Because, you know, each teacher teaches his system and he's, that is the best thing in the world to him. Um, and, And sometimes we'll get caught up in that too. Oh, well, my teacher said it's the best. Well, teacher number two said it was the best too. Teacher number three said it was the best too. And that's, that's good. And when you're with them, it is the best, but we want to have the ability to de-systemize the information and pick what is the high percentage of success applications for us and then simplify them and then do it consistently over time, which takes planning. Wow. <laughs> A lot of, yeah, that's, that's amazing. That that sounds like that would be a, a, a great way of, of strategizing things and having it so that it's more uniform, right? Throughout the practices for everyone that it's not just each teacher has their own methodology, their own way. You want to like yeah. uniform, harmonize. I want to ask you, what role do you feel discipline has in incorporating oh, wow. practices, methodologies, and beliefs as a as a trainer, as a warrior, as a, in your, in your field, what do you think about this in its role? You know, it, it's a uh, overused word. <laughs> um, discipline can be applied to your mind. It can be applied to your body, your spirit. Um, it can be applied to anything. Um, for me, um, you know, like I say, I follow the warrior's path and people will learn things in different ways. But um, like I'll learn a lot of times different applications in the physical form first. So I learned to discipline my body and going through the process of learning to discipline myself. In, in other words, connecting my mind to my body. And this is just one form of discipline. This is probably the, the shallowest level is when I think it, my body does it. And what's an example of that? You know, like in a martial arts class, we, we have people line up for class and they'll put their hands at their side and look straight ahead. But sometimes their toes, one toe might be turned off to the side. And so you'll kind of go. <clears throat> hey, <it's your> toe. <laughs> and so they'll they'll go. They'll give you the look like hey, my toe. And so they look down and go, oh, wow, it's not in the right place. And they scoot it in straight in their mind. It was in the right place but their body's not listening. So um, the first level of discipline in body is I just want to get my body to do what I tell it, which is harder than I expected because I, you know, I I tell it to do a lot of things. And and even when it does it today, it doesn't mean it won't buck tomorrow because that's a (laughs) good, it never ends. And then as you get to the deeper levels of discipline, you know, it could be, For instance, the learning to control the amount of flexion that you have in the muscular system of the body, uh, which directly relates to strength. And and you look at, you know, healing, uh, Qigong or meditation, there's really different levels of it. You know, there's the healing level, which is, I think, most popular in the West, but you also have the warrior gong, warrior qigong, or you could say warrior meditation, which is very physical. They relate it to combat. You have the scholar gong or meditation, which is related to enriching the mind and learning. So on the back to the physical, how do I find depth in that physical uh, discipline? So what are the methods that I can use to get a greater control of the flexion of the muscle in the body maybe? Um, on the other end of the spectrum is the ability to relax because depending on your diet, uh, your, your, your stress levels every day, you know, I'm, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia and driving in Atlanta sometimes, <laughs> sometimes will stress you out <laughs> and you collect that stuff and you take it home. So uh, on the other end of the scale is, do I have the ability to turn off the tension levels in my body? And some people don't. You know, so I have to sit and I have to concentrate and I have to get that tension to release and turn off, uh, which is physical discipline. And I think in all things, um, physical, mental, spiritual, spiritual, you have two energies that, that you can relate. And one is expansion and one is contraction. 
And, and, and you know, we we're talking about simplifying earlier. So this is one of the ways I, I simplify is I know there's an expansive idea. There's going to be a contractive idea. So I need to be able to gain discipline. And since we're speaking in the physical form first, um, on both ends of that, I've got to learn to relax. That, that's going to be the, you know, most people, when they think meditation, uh, it's just relaxation, but it, it gives you a greater control of your body or, you know, when another way we could say it is it gives you greater discipline of what you're focusing on your mind, um, your, you know, uh, the emotional centers of the body, you know, which is huge in, in Qigong and meditation, because I, sometimes that's tough to control. I could go back to Atlanta traffic, you know, <laughs> it'll jump out there before you know it. And as um, meditation practitioners or in, in just in my opinion, fr from a warrior's approach, we should have a discipline of emotional energy. How do we do that? You know, and you know, sometimes that gets served uh, the methodology or, or the way to, to do it through meditations or um, Qigong's practices over time. I want to ask you this. What role do you feel breath work plays in your practice on a daily basis with maintaining oh, wow. <laughs> what you do? Uh, you mentioned the book earlier. It, it's a huge part of it. Um, Let's We can dive into the book now, by the way. I wanted to ask you, you the warrior's path to self improvement. How did you come up with the title and what motivated you to write this book? Oh, wow. Um, and then we can dive into the breath work. <laughs> okay. We'll come back. You know, I mentioned being fortunate enough to have teachers and mentors that not only just taught me how to fight and that type of thing, but they started to teach you principles that you could apply to life and to better yourself, you know, not only on the mat, but outside in the real world. And um, I've found over the years that the academy floor opportunities to practice these things pop up twice a week. If you're there three times a week, it just is a beautiful environment to force you to grow, <laughs> um, to deal with the deal with pain, to deal with emotional control, controlling the mind, because you're put in situations where it's challenged on a regular basis. Same thing happened to me. So maybe I would go a few rounds with uh, Mr. Helm's sons and I'd get beat up and I'd be out the side. Oh, God, I can't miss all those guys. And he would come over and he'd go, you know, you're letting something control you. I don't even think you're aware of the fact that it's controlling you. And he, so he would point it out and he'd go, here is a way that you can start to turn that around and you can get control over it and then eventually use it as a strength. Well, this stuff wasn't written down on any curriculum. Like I'd get the list of things that I had to test on and it would, none of that was on it. I punched and kicked. And so I went on and I was fortunate enough. I've always pursued uh, continuous growth in the martial arts. So I've, I've met a lot of instructors. I love them. And <laughs> The next guy would do the same thing. He'd be teaching me, but then he'd see a little something and he'd go, you know, you should get control of your body in this way a little more. Have you ever thought of this? And I go, that's a great idea. I could apply that to life. I'm going to write that down. So this process happened over and over again for years. And eventually I'm a uh, avid note taker. I have literally hundreds of notebooks. <laughs> so I have a notebook <laughs> That is all those little principles that I learned in between class or on the corner of the map from my teachers that helped me achieve more, be more, grow more in life. So when I started teaching, well, same process, I'd see something and I'd go, hey, you ever thought about this? And I'd always get the same response. Why isn't this on the curriculum? Why don't you teach this in a class? And I was like, well, this is how it was done. So I'm passing it along the same way. Well, you should write it down. You should make a manual. You should teach a class. So I started kind of writing out an outline. What would I teach? How would I pass this on if I were just to focus on these life development skills? Uh, and it was kind of behind the scenes, and I just played around with it. That's another curse I have is I write curriculum. 
<laughs> uh, sometimes on things that I'm never going to teach, but uh, it's part of the passion. And so I collected those notes. Well, 35 years. So here comes the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> the phone turns off. There's no text. There's no calls. There's no emails. Mm. Everybody disappears and the school closed. So uh, what did I do? I said, I'm going to go up into the mountains of uh, Virginia and take a couple of months off and just chill out. And That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so during that time, I happened to have that notebook and I was like, you know, I'm going to write up that curriculum. Where's my laptop? And probably took three days before I realized this is going to be a book. And I never, I'm not the type of guy to write books. I, uh, you know, I never would have thought something like that would come out of me. But then I, why not? I, I, well, I think I you just, are. <laughs> From my perspective, I mean, well, I'm actually editing the second one now. That's so what I mean. It's, I can see multiple. <laughs> it's caught fire, you know. So it ended up being around 360 pages of you know, before I ended up coming back to Atlanta of information. And that is how it got put together. Um, you know, it was kind of, in my opinion, a mind dump. Uh, and I was like, well, I might be valuable. And wow, you know, I can't tell you the amount of contacts that have gotten back in touch with me, emails with questions, which fueled the entire outline for the book too. Um, so that's how that happened. <laughs> what, how did you come up with the title? The warrior, the warrior's path to self-improvement. I love the title because it, it, it's like a mantra for me. Like when you talk about self-improvement and the path to it, it that's how I look at my life every day. <laughs> that's great. Uh, well, I, I had nicknamed the program, the warrior's path years ago. And um, you know, you've got different, life improvement coaches out there yeah. and they have different approaches. And, you know, of course I'm like, I, I checked them out. What does this guy do? What does this guy do? Man, it's great. But I've always approached it from uh, the warrior's philosophy. You know, um, that's just who I was. That's how I grew up and how I was taught. So a lot of how I approach maybe similar self-improvement principles it has that warrior's flavor. <laughs> That's great. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, it, we may want to learn like some emotional control meditation or work. And so we've got to create a little emotional upheaval. And I mean, there's nothing in the world like getting choked or punched in the face <laughs> <laughs> to bring that out. So to me, it's like the perfect environment. Uh, of course, I have a lot of clients that, you know, they don't want to do that necessarily. So we find other ways, uh, but they understand the process and what they're trying to achieve. And the main goal is, you know, if, if you don't get it on the academy floor or create it on your own, life will give them to you. Exactly. Sometimes it comes up and gives it, gives it to you and you handle it incorrectly. And then two hours <laughs> later, you're like, I didn't handle that so well. So we try to stay on the lookout for those events and recognize them early. Go, Oh, this is one of those events. And, you know, as long as it's not too big of a punch in the face, some of them are minor, you know, cause later we look back and go, it probably wasn't that big a deal. But if I can do that in the moment, I can go practice. You know, is a real life thing happened to me. I recognize that I'm losing complete control of a huge energetic system in my body, my emotional system. And man, it's controlling me. I'm, my, my temperature's going up. I'm, I'm, my face is changing colors. <laughs> and, you know, here I am wasting energy of my day and time based on somebody that probably doesn't even know what's going on with me right now. Um, and it's not that I don't need to deal with it, but why do I allow it to shut me down, control me, and really steal energy from me? You know, as we get farther along the journey, we only have so much. And, you know, as you get a little older, you have a little less, you have a little less. So we, it's important to understand where those energy leaks come from. 
And one of the huge ones is uh, not having discipline of the emotional system. You know, it'll steal your whole day and maybe a couple of days if you let it. So it's a life skill to be able to recognize it. Man, look, you know, because, you know, you hear this in five years, who's going to care? And that, that's true. You know, I look back now, 20 years ago, it was a really good lesson. But the biggest thing is that I let it steal that from me. Uh, I let it control me. Uh, it, I didn't have to be that big of an impact. So I want to try to learn, gain that wisdom and use it moving forward as best I can. <clears throat> what do you? What do you think about the subconscious? Because I know it plays a role in our daily lives when we have to deal with things that are in our subconscious mind. I know part of your, your, one of your chapters mentions the subconscious creative, like being able to look under the surface, right? And, and, delve it, and delve into it for helping us understand and focus ourselves. I wanted to ask you, what role do you feel that the subconscious plays in gaining focus in your life when you're training for a fight or when you're trying to learn a certain technique? Uh, well, for me, um, you know, the subconscious can be a noisy place. Um, <laughs> I have a, by myself, I had a very busy mind. And um, when information goes in, sometimes, you know, I think I'm clearing my conscious mind, but it's still bouncing around back there. Things will come up that I have no control over and it steals consciousness. So um, to me, one of the first things I did was I had to shut off or limit what was going in. And my teacher introduced me to the idea of looking at information like television, what's on the radio. And, you know, I know maybe it's information, but it's information that stays in there. What you allow in you know, doesn't always go away. Sometimes it'll go into the subconscious and you'll be dealing with it later on. So I tried to quiet, quieten the noise that I was allowing in. Now, everybody can't do this. Um, you know, I was, maybe I was going to the extreme, but like uh, I turned the TV off. I turned the radio off. Uh, one of the biggest things uh, later after that was gossip, you know, little things like that. And I had to get to the point where I'm like, look, I don't want that. I don't need it. It's got nothing to do with me. It doesn't affect my decisions. Um, and like, we have a rule at the Academy. Um, if you're going to do it, you'll only do it at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, and the running joke it, uh, is that we usually are doing our lunch standing and it lasts about 10 minutes. So you better get it out quick. <laughs> I love that. Uh, you know, uh, a little bit of that gossip can go in there. And then later, you know, I might be focused on something that's important and then pops back into the conscious. Of, what? What'd she say? And now here I am wasting life energy on a thought because it will steal it from you. And uh, so for me, that was a big thing that I could handle uh, externally, turn off the noise. Um you know, like news, I know you got to have information, but sometimes news is just, <laughs> but, you know, I could do without it for a little while. <laughs> sure. Understandable, especially the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, and for me, um, I, I like I'll get some, I have some short podcasts that I listen to and I choose them and it's just information. This is what happened today. And that's it. Um, and so I try to intelligently choose what I allow to go in. And the outcome with that is I got quietness. There was more peace. There was more, a less interruption from the subconscious in the conscious. And so it gave me more ability to focus um, or more control over my conscious energy, which is, you know, you have to have in order to do anything. Maybe I want to have the discipline to get up and do a push up in the morning. You have to have that mental presence and that consciousness available to you. Um, and the more of it you have, the more you'll get done. I mean, I, I, I'm sure everybody knows that person that can be very focused, that they're like a laser beam. And, and sometimes it's natural. Mm -hmm. I, I've known guys who just are gifted with it. And I've known guys like myself 
and have to fight for it because it's very busy. <laughs> I have a, I have ADD too. I, I know what that feels like. Your yeah. mind bounces like a, a ball all over the place. Sometimes I'll be working on something creative and then I have my lawyer job and I switch back and forth and I got to literally just sit and ground myself to focus for a minute and, and focus on the matter at hand. So I, I relate to what you're saying and I understand I now too. the energy like, behind uh, I, your I work on max and yeah. they have multiple desktops <laughs> and I'll have project on eight different desktops and when i start to lose it i'll try to switch over to the next one you could <laughs> handle a lot yeah. of projects at a given i can do we can handle a lot yeah. of things at a given time because our mind is designed for that but when it comes to like sitting you know and, and, and reading a big book and sitting it's like ah that right. requires <laughs> effort <laughs> yeah it does i agree it's uh sitting still is tough um, for sure but again i i i look at it as being a superpower you know i mean Cause there's people who have difficulty getting up from sitting and, you know, they're like, I'm going to sit here for a few hours. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are different people struggle with different goals or outcomes that they're trying to achieve. And mine was just trying to control the noise and the excessive amount of energy. I am. Um, I'm looking at your morning routine that you put in your book and I'll just share for the audience. It says, here's an example of my morning routine. I think I'm on like page I don't usually quote books, but this is good. I want to share this. It shows breathing and focus exercises, visualization exercise, music and motivational audio intake, gratitude drill, drink water supplements, brain coffee, power juice, protein drink. That's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Brush your teeth, writing, scripting, and research, and then physical exercise and stretching. And the reason I'm asking, I'm reading this into the into the show right now is I'm fascinated that you broke, that you're, you're right. You're a simplifier. <laughs> You simplify things and develop things in such a way for, for, for a structure and a routine that literally you're able to fit what you want in the parameters of your morning. And I, I find that very gratifying. That has to be very rewarding for you when you start that routine. One of the things of this whole routine that I looked at was your gratitude drill. And I was curious, what is your gratitude drill like? And would you be willing to share an example of it with our audience? Oh, wow. Uh, well, it'll, it'll change. Uh, I actually, Believe it or not, I have a gratitude journal. <laughs> um, and, you know, different things will come along in life that you're grateful for. And, you know, some things you're grateful for will give you a tremendous amount of passion and energy. You know, so let's imagine a new relationship. For a lot of people, you know, you, wow, I have energy today. I, I want to go. Uh, this person excites me, gives me a bunch of energy. And, you know, maybe five years from now, it is something else. I got a new car. I'm so pumped about it. So the topics of your gratitude could change. And then you have some that will not change, you know, like your family, um, you know. So an example of it would be, well, for me, I just woke up today. I'm pretty grateful for that. <laughs> I'm grateful for the house I'm in. Uh, I'm grateful that I get to do uh, what I love every day and I get to help people. And I, and, you know, one of the big things for that for me is I'm helping more people. I mean, I'm like making contacts with people like you and it's, there's value in it. And that's, I love that. That feeds me uh, to do more. So just things like that, you know, um, individuals that are in my life. I, I'm grateful for that person, you know, because um, those true blue friends. I mean, if you can count them on one hand, you're gifted. Um, so I take time to recognize that personally. And it usually turns into, I'll send them a text. Uh, hey, you know, I'm grateful for you. Uh, those guys, you know, they're like, that's odd, but you know, I've done it for so many years now. They're like, you know, they know, know what it is. So it will look something like that. And occasionally, you know, something else will come along in life. Um, and that might move to the top of the list. And for me, I, I track them on a weekly basis because, uh, you know, it helps me keep them organized in my mind. And right off the bat, I can tap into that and it automatically gives me energy, gives me passion. You know, maybe I'm having a day where <clears throat> I don't feel like going to the gym today. <laughs> um, well, that's why that gratitude drill and those emo these energy drills are first 
because, you know, I've had days where when I first roll out of bed, no, <laughs> I go through that process and then I'm like, yes, it's going to happen today. Um, so that, that would be a brief example. You know, gratitude resonates with me. A couple of years ago, I had stage one kidney cancer. I had early detection. I had a surgery, removed it, and it, it got me to lose 50 pounds, changed my perspective. I'm really into that manifestation and meditation, all those things. And awesome positivity is such a powerful force, right? And the fact that you utilize gratitude as part of your morning routine to me shows the positive nature of what you do and the tone you do it. And one of the things I wanted to do with our interview is, is kind of see where you, how you conceptualize things to be successful and do what you do and ach achieve these things. And I, I really am appreciative that you're actually letting, sharing this with us because I find it very valuable. I think members of our audience will as well when they're dealing with their own challenges, they can say, you know what, maybe I need increased structure in my life. Maybe if I read The Warrior's Path to Self-Improvement, I can learn from you as the author how to, how to structure my life better. Maybe I have ADD and I didn't never really paid attention to it. And my mind is always all over the place, right? Uh, right. One of my college returning brothers, we used to tease him because he used to always say, let's go ride our bikes. <laughs> We're like, it's 3 a.m. What are you talking about? Because his mind was all over the place. Right. My, my, my point in sharing that with you is... I appreciate your message because I think it is something that, you know, you can't bottle what you have and then put it on a shelf and, and distribute it. But a book is the second best thing to that because you're taking what you had in your little journal and all those little pieces of paper, right? And you put them together from 35 years and you compiled it into this. And that's why I, th I think that's amazing, uh, something to share with our audience. And so if our audience wanted to get the warrior's path to self-improvement, where would they where would they be able to find it? Amazon. And I guess what I want to do is have you direct my audience to your website. And I'm going to have everything in the program notes, but I always like to give you an opportunity of directing where you would want to be contacted. If anyone from our show wants to reach out to you further and find out more about your book and, and what you offer. Uh, well, the book's on Amazon. Um, so just look it up by title. Um, and if you're looking to get in touch with me, it's, uh, Sifu Allen Baker, S I F U A L A N B A K E R.com. And, uh, we, we do coaching, you know, if you like the book, I've had a lot of guys, uh, a lot of clients get in touch just to do individual coaching. Um, they, we do it on many different ways, uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly, uh, it's up to the client and what their goals are. Um, all of my contact information is on the website. Um, if, if you read the book and it benefits you, you have value and you want to send a note, I love that. Uh, so feel free to get in touch anytime. Uh, nothing like it. I'm looking at your book and one of the things you talk about with goal setting is to create a visual path to your goal. I wanted right. to see if you could explain that to our audience a little about what, that, what exactly that process entails. Um, well, uh, it could be something as easy as, uh, sometimes I've heard them nicknamed vision boards. Um, yes. but I have one of those yeah. <laughs> it's in my room. Um, uh, I also <laughs> will get representations of, at, um, outcomes that I want to achieve. And in, and it may not be a photo of specifically that outcome, but it may be something that represents it to me. And, uh, you know, I can cut it out of a magazine and put it on the wall, or I can get a really good photograph of it, put it in a frame, set it on the desk, and it, it gives it a little more energy so that it, so when I look at that, you know, it represents to me what outcome I want to achieve. And um, the next thing I will do with that is one is just to see it and it motivates you. You're like, I'm, I'm going to get up and do it because that's my thing. But also, you know, we talked earlier about entering state and I like to start to connect emotional energy to that as well. Uh, and it might not be an emotional thought or pattern that is necessarily related to the outcome. So I, I may put two photos in the frame. Now they may be somewhat related, but one is an emotional uh, image for me. And that feeds the growth of energy and I relate it to that outcome. And for me, it drives me to do one more small, consistent step in that direction. And, you know, those small, consistent steps over time is what makes it happen. 
you know, I won't achieve it quickly. Um, that's just not true as far as I'm concerned. Everything I've ever done took a lot of time. And, uh, you know, uh, even if I pushed hard, well, it still took time. And most of the most effective effort and time was just consistency two times a week for four years. Um, and then that started to build up. And so the, I choose imagery around that. Um, you know, I try to choose those goals. Um, you know, we talk in the book about the master filter. So I, I try to go through the master filter to um, make sure I'm keeping a thousand mile view of where I'm going, uh, both with finance you know, like uh, how I'm setting up the financial structure, the support system that allows me to get up in the morning and take time to breathe. <laughs> uh, you know, it makes me reference freedom. Um, sometimes, especially as a go-getter, uh, you know, we'll get overly trapped in achievement. And I have to make myself, I have to back up to the thousand mile view every now and then and make myself make sure there's freedom in the equation. Um, and I don't get trapped in it. Family is in there because, I mean, sometimes we get so focused, so driven that we don't pay proper amount of attention to those true blue friends that we mentioned earlier. <laughs> um, and, you know, they're there no matter what. So we don't want that to happen. And then health, you know. Um, so for me, like those are some of the major outcomes that I want growth in. And imagery may be chosen in relation to those achievements or the outcome that I'm trying to, to achieve. You, you know, interestingly, what you just described, I, for what I do, my vision board, I call it manifestation and visualization, right? It's a similar concept uh, in, in my own way. I'll have my vision board and I, I just, it's a dry erase board, fancy name for a dry erase board. You put your goals up there. And I focus on it when I meditate. I'll write my goal. If I have I want to do some amazing interviews for my podcast associated with mixed martial arts or, you know, discipline or focus. I'll put that up on the board and I'll meditate on it. And then from that meditation and focus, I get inspired. And without even realizing it, I'll be in the middle of my day and all of a sudden I'll go on Google and I'll, I'll put something in there that'll pop me in a direction. It's like, it, it kind of directs me like a map. And that's how visualization works for me, at least. It, it guides me through my day and prioritizes things. And so I, I love the fact that you are able to share that in your own way and have the focus and, and, and the ability to channel it in, in towards your goals with visualizations and images and those kind of things. I um I, I find that amazing. What have you what have you learned from setbacks in your life? And how do you view setbacks now as compared to when you first started? working on your book? Oh, wow. Uh, I love them. <laughs> um, you know, you, you cannot have success and without failure. And, you know, like I said earlier, from just a warrior's perspective, I learned it on the mat. Like, you don't just go out there and you're just awesome. <laughs> you're not <laughs> You're not awesome for a long time before you get anywhere near halfway looking like you're awesome. And the more you deny that you're not awesome, the longer it's going to take. <laughs> and if you avoid those situations where you're not awesome, in other words, failure, it's going to take longer. So, you know, as, as warriors and, and approaching it, we understand that and we seek those moments where we are thrust into the unknown, the into failure, um, you know, a lot of times we avoid it. It's human nature to avoid it. But you start to look at how things happen in the journey. It's unavoidable. And, you know, the more the way I look at it with my guys is let's get out here and make as many mistakes as we can, because <laughs> where does wisdom come from. It comes from fucking up. So the more I can do it, the more I'm going to learn, the more I'm going to know, and the faster I can do it. I just go own it. I don't run from it. So setbacks, failures are some of the best teachers out there. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when, I, when we have a failure too, it's like, I'm going to cover this up. 
I'm going to boost you. I don't, yeah, nobody <laughs> needs to see that. And we you know we've got to <laughs> throw it out there. And not only that, we've got to study it, you know, and sometimes that's tough uh, looking at how bad you messed up and, and owning what you did, but that's where the education comes from. Um, so I, I tend to look at, look at failures and setbacks not only is a good thing, but we go seek them out. You know, we, we will put ourselves into environments or, you know, you could say a situation where I know more is going to happen and let's just get it over with and, and <laughs> start to get that wisdom that's going to put us back on path to, you know, our goal, our outcome or wherever we're, we're headed. I had quite a few with the book, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I love that you mentioned in the Warriors Path. You have a section talking about dealing with sadness and depression because mental health awareness is important to me. Um, I dealt with mental health issues in my life, and I know probably most every single person on this planet had some level of some type of mental health issue going on since 2020 with the pandemic and everything else. And I want to ask you, how do you approach um, dealing with sadness and depression? with the warrior's path? Like what have you gained in your knowledge and training that you would recommend to our audience? Like if you have sadness or depression, here's how warriors and ancient Chinese, you know, Chinese medicine deals with it. Or like what kind of approach do you find that might be unique to share? Well, um, sometimes in, in my study, what I've learned is, uh, you know, we tend to run from it, you know, and we don't allow ourselves to, experience it, uh, which keeps us from kind of finding the source for it. And, you know, it was like different meditations. As you meditate, sometimes those types of things will come up in meditation, you know, um, and I'll just push it out. But we it's there for a reason. You know, your body holds on to things sometimes um, like toxins from diet, bad experiences in life it'll hold on to those things. And the more we choose not to deal with it or, or take a look at it and, you know, well, what happened? Why is it this way? The, I think it gets more ingrained into the body and into the mind. So when you're doing your meditation and you open your mind, you try to clear it. Sometimes what is marched across the stage are those things. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take a deeper look at it. Why is that there? You know, um, for instance, is it something I did? Um, and it might be something that I'm not spoken to this person in years. Um, maybe I need to call them up and go, hey, man, you know, we both made a mistake. But I just want to say for my part of that mistake, um, sorry about that and deal with it. Uh, and that might not there's many processes to do it. You know, sometimes you just you can uh, forgive yourself for doing it. Um, it depends on the individual from what I found, but you deal with it and you attempt to go through the process of through dealing with it, letting it go. And I've found, you know, especially when you do those quiet moments in meditation, uh, once I start doing those things, it pops up less. Um, I, you know, it's, it's marched across the stage less, but it may be something else. And, um, you know, it could be a list. <laughs> I may have no ignored those things for years. Um, but in my experience, it's when it's there, there's a reason for it. And, uh, you know, I, I personally, I'll look for a way. How am I going to deal with this? Whatever it is. And will that help? You know, yeah. You know, even though nobody knows, I was probably wrong. <laughs> and, uh, me just, I can, I can keep that. I can hide that. Um, or I can just go, Hey, look, I was wrong. And there's a lot of relief in that. That's and sad. it's just to me, it's like getting physical toxins out of the body. Um, you know, if you the purge, right. In a good way, you're getting rid of the excess negativity that's left over residual and you're purging it so that you can become lighter and better, you know, suited for what you need to do in your life. I agree. And, you know, and it's sometimes you'll be presented those things in meditation or whatever. 
And, you know, you're in a situation where I'm at work, I'm in front of people, and I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to shut it off. And, in, you know, taking the time in the morning, for instance, to do a meditation and dealing with it, whatever that is, letting it out. <laughs> Nobody's there. It's just you, you know, <laughs> and that, that thought or that uh, pain from the past, whatever it is, uh, because we don't, you know, we get busy in life and, and a lot of, you know, I've heard it said a minute, I just don't have time for that. You know, well, you eventually will, because in my opinion, it'll get built up so much that you can ignore it. Um, that's when it starts coming into more into focus, more into the now and, you know, having those negative effects. What's one thing that you've not shared on a podcast about yourself that you'd be willing to share today? And I'll go first, make this easy. But for example, I watch World War II documentaries a lot. I really am into them. I've always enjoyed watching them and I am kind of nerdy about it. You know, my grandfather was in the war and it's just something I feel like I've always felt connected to. So when people around me, they're like, are you really watching that right now? I'm like, yeah, it's a great documentary about the Battle of the Bulge. Like that's just me being nerdy. And when I went to Europe a couple of years back, I actually went and, um, and like looked at World War II sites and battle sites and all those kind of things. So that's just a hobby of mine, I guess, a passion of mine. And I also love podcasting, obviously. I want to ask you, like, do you, what, what other passions do you have in your life that you'd like to share or hobby or just personal tidbit? Uh, well, um, I love diving. Um, I've, I've pursued growth in that area. I'm not obviously more known for other areas, but I've gone, uh, I'm a fully certified cave diver. I've done some crazy dives uh, <laughs> underneath the earth. Um, dive instructor, um, just taught a class last weekend. Um, about, I'm also a rappel master instructor. So I uh, train a lot of uh, rappel masters, different rescue teams and that type of thing. I love getting out on the mountain, out in the canyon where there's no cell service, nobody can get in touch with you. Uh, you know, I've had moments where, you know, you're on a 300 foot rappel hanging on the side of a mountain and it's nothing. It's just you, wind, there's nothing like it. It's amazing. Same thing with diving. You know, you, I, I think of one of the trips we took to Mexico recently and it's just silence and you're literally weightless. You might hear a bubble every now and then, but it's just for me, it's a powerful moment. Um, I do a lot of shooting, I teach a lot of shooting. Uh, it's just, you know, one of the things I do that I'm not known for. <laughs> uh, so uh, that may be a couple of things that that's awesome. You, <laughs> you know what, what you just shared with me made me think of this. And this is one thing I'd love to know. So many people are crippled by their fears. So many people fear this, fear that, right? And during the pandemic, a lot of people that's been exacerbated. And it sounds like you've mastered overcome fear of things. Ooh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> something, something. I mean, being being in, in, in your in your field, I mean, you have to be able to steer and direct and channel your intentions away from fear. Cause I'm sure there's moments where you could be fearful. And I want to oh, ask wow. you. What have you found for yourself in terms of having that mastery over that to understand fear in one's life, but put it in a box and, and not let it, you know, cripple you and overcome. And uh, well, you know, for me, you know, I like to make sure that in my personal education process that I've forced myself to visit it uh, periodically through time. At the very least, we're going to do this four times a year. I probably do it a little more. And it's one of the big things that got me in the cave diving is because, um, you know, I was never claustrophobic. But when I started cave diving the, and the cave started getting smaller and smaller. And, you know, I remember a dive where I could feel my tank on the rock above me. And there were moments where I could feel the, the bottom of the cave or the hole in this case, uh, below me. And it's one of the first times I've felt claustrophobic. And, I, you know, at that moment, it's like, oh, wow. Uh, you know, it got me. But the fact that it got me made me come back and do it again <laughs> until I got it under control. Um, I was fortunate to have a great teacher. Um, you know, he, he probably knew that I, I saw it as a challenge and he was a type of teacher that created challenges. And, um, you know, I, I kept doing that for a long time until I got to the point where I wasn't having it anymore. 
and even in repelling, there's been some repels that were crazy. And uh, I'd be halfway through it and, you know, you, whoa, wow, go, go back down, hike out, and we're going to do it again. <laughs> and that's just me. Um, we spoke earlier about creating um, opportunities to practice discipline, and it may be discipline of fear or discipline of some other emotion. Well, you know, it's like sometimes those things are created by a car crash, and I don't want to repeat that. But like in, in my life, the climbing, the rappelling, the diving, those created those things. Um, and I was able, once I recognized I want, I'm going to go back and do it again, and this time I'm going to use, we, we mentioned this earlier, I, I always refer to the breath as the bridge. It is one of the triggers to state whether you are trying to get in control of your current state or you're trying to change it. Uh, one of the best triggers is your breath. You're in charge of it. And the cool thing is it's connected to everything, physical, your mental, your emotional. So that's one of the first things, you know, so we get back on that rope and we're going to go do that repel again. <laughs> and then when you start to experience uh, that, say that emotional spike that's the first thing i do and i teach my guys to do is your first thing is the breath uh, the breath is the bridge to control everything else the better you learn to use it and then learn to use it well the better you are at understanding breath and its many avenues it is one of the most powerful things you can learn to be in charge of the human machine um and it will just get in control of that breath, that an initial trigger allows you to reach out and kind of pull or rein those things back in, uh, re whatever they're dealing with. So I love that. I actually use breath work myself on, on different things throughout my day. And, and I find it's a very aligning thing. It's a very grounding thing. Right. And it gives us an ability to, to get charge and take charge of our irrational thoughts on occasion or our fears that you're describing. I, I, we're running low on time. If you could believe how fast this interview goes, <laughs> it, it, it flies. It's like laser speed, uh, light, light speed. I want to ask you this. If you were a spirit animal, which spirit animal would you be and why? And if you want, I can go fast. I'll let you know. I always say owl because I have two parrots. I grew up with parrots. It's just me. But um, I always search and quest my quest for wisdom as a lawyer, as a psychic, as a podcaster. I'm guided by wisdom. And I look at the psychic in me looks at obstacles as just something to go around over or beyond. And I believe real big in, 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 in paradigms. And so for me, wisdom feeds the paradigm change in my life to help me expand and grow and become better at where I am at, from one day before or from a second earlier. Uh, I guess I'd have to go with uh, uh, Yip Fu, uh, which is the tiger. Okay. Uh, you know, they, they tend to go forward under pressure. I've always, <laughs> or it could be a ram. I could look at it that way too, because I tend to go into pressure um, sometimes <laughs> when I shouldn't. Uh, so I, I guess I'd have to go with, with that guy. <laughs> I want to thank Sifu Alan Baker for coming on the show today and sharing his expertise and his personal insight. It's, it's a great opportunity when you get the chance to really understand uh, different viewpoints on these very important aspects of life. I love our ability to, to have a dialogue and talk about the warrior's path to self-improvement. Uh, I'm going to have all the information that you can look at for uh, Alan in the show notes and I would definitely encourage you to check out the Warriors Path to Self Improvement. There's a lot of insight and a lot of very useful tips on how to organize your thoughts and how to approach things and look at things. And that, those things are very helpful. I mean, when you take someone who spent 35 years of their life gathering this information and it took the pandemic to give the opportunity to create the Warriors Path, I would say let's take advantage of. What's out there? Let's read this thing. Let's let's discuss it with our peers. Let's 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 look at it and, and let's see what exactly we can learn and glean from this information because we can all grow and transform and change in many ways. And a lot of it requires a discipline within ourselves. And most of us struggle in different ways with things in our lives. You know, there, there are people like myself and Al. We're talking about having ADD 
or having mental health issues. I'm saying, you know, just we, we're plagued by things in life and how we approach our lives. It's all about prioritizing, simplifying, as Alan said. I love the idea of having a gratitude drill. I'm going to start doing that in my mornings when you can be awesome. grateful for all the things in your life and, and be grateful for the things that you still have to do and achieve and connect all these things. So check it out. Check out. I, I really thank Sifu Alan Baker for coming on the show. Uh, stay positive because when you're positive, anything's possible. Thank you so much for supporting the show. There will be more amazing guests coming on. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook. And don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms, and know that the universe is always yours to explore.